Item number, SCP-150. Object class, Keter. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-150 patients kept for study should be contained in level 3 biohazard containment cells, with no more than one instance per cell. Cultures of SCP-150 are contained in vacuum-sealed glass flasks in the Site-42 Infectious Materials Lab. Standard pathogen handling procedures should be followed at all times. Any instances of SCP-150 found outside of containment are to be incinerated. Description SCP-150 is an obligate parasite that resembles the tongue-eating louse, Zymothoa exigua, but is adapted to form conjunctive symbiotic relationships with humans for a period of its lifespan. Upon contact with a human subject, SCP-150 embeds itself deeply in the flesh of its host. Over the course of approximately seven days, the parasite will burrow into the host and affect numerous physiological alterations. The most glaring alteration is the gradual conversion of the limb nearest the infection site into a chitinous appendage. As SCP-150 consumes the host's flesh, it excretes tissue that replaces and augments the functionality of the host's limb without causing transplant rejection. It is suspected that SCP-150 is able to secrete anesthetic and immunosuppressant substances to prevent the host's body from responding to the change. Furthermore, the nervous tissue excreted by SCP-150 is able to interface with the host's nervous system. By the time the process is complete, the host will be able to control the affected limb with no loss in mobility and often with improved strength, reflexes, and resilience. For a period of one to two weeks, SCP-150 will reproduce, feeding on nutrients from and depositing eggs into assimilated blood vessels. It is hypothesized that SCP-150 can self-fertilize. The eggs are deposited throughout the human body via the bloodstream, while the vast majority of them die off. Enough survive to begin colonizing and altering the rest of the host's body. Though subjects report discomfort and occasional loss of motor control during this process, they often will not recognize the cause of said discomfort. It is still unclear why the offspring do not compete with each other for space or resources, nor how the assimilation process leaves the body's cell signaling mechanisms and processes unaffected. SCP-150 reproduces during this assimilation process, as the lungs are assimilated. More eggs are produced and spread by the patient's coughing. Although as many as 10,000 eggs may be produced during this time, it is estimated that only 1% of them find their way into another host, of which 1% survive the host's immune response and implant successfully. Although SCP-150 inevitably results in the assimilation and alteration of the central nervous system, including the spinal cord and brain, the host's consciousness and behavior are seemingly unaffected. Interviews with subjects infected by SCP-150 have yielded little information, as infected subjects unaware of SCP-150 claim to sense no changes or improvement in certain senses and faculties. While subjects aware of the infection are able to pinpoint the source of the change, they exhibit little to no negative feelings and often express positivity towards it. Addendum 150E Transcript of Exploratory Leucotomy and Nervous Tissue Transformation Experiments Two D-Class Subjects, D-13732 and D-016002, were infected with SCP-150 and allowed to progress through all stages of the infection. In order to examine the full effect of the infection, exploratory neurosurgeries were performed on both subjects. D-13732 was euthanized. His nervous tissue was found to have been entirely replaced by smaller instances of SCP-150. The instances comprising his brain matter were extracted and stored for experimentation on D-016002. The following decompressive craniotomy and leucotomy were performed by Dr. Harlan's son, Dr. Wendy Robin, and Dr. Alex Harlow on D-016002. A full transcript follows. Begin log. 2143. D-016002 is partially anesthetized to numb her during the initial drilling of the skull. The process is uneventful, though Harlow reports expecting less resistance from the skull while drilling into and cutting a flap from it. 
Upon removing the flap of bone and exposing the dura mater, numerous smaller instances of SCP-150 are observed lying in the cranial cavity, where the brain should be. Harlow reports this to Robin, who alerts Sun to begin the interview process while she marks off areas of D016002's brain on a mapping projection. Dr. Sun, what is your name? D016002. Mako. Dr. Sun, name something to sit in. D016002. Chair. Dr. Sun, what is the color of grass? D016002. Green. Dr. Sun, what is one plus one? D016002 pauses for a moment. D016002. Two. Dr. Robin, we have marked off the approximate location of the Wernix area, the part of the brain that controls speech recognition and use. Dr. Harlow, thank you, doctor. Son, I will now extract some of the specimens from this area. Dr. Harlow carefully makes an incision into the dura mater and extracts some of the instances from the area using forceps. He places each instance into a glass vial, corks it, and places it on a nearby stand. Each instance appears to stir to life and begin wriggling only upon being removed. This process takes approximately 10 minutes, during which time Sun repeatedly asks D016002 the same questions. Once Harlow has extracted approximately 100 instances, he gestures for Sun to continue. Dr. Sun, name something to sit in. D016002, uh, uh, seat. Dr. Sun, what is the color of grass? D016002, green? Dr. Sun, what is one plus one? D016002, two. Dr. Sun, note for the record that D016002's responses have been slightly slowed. This indicates that the instances within her cranial cavity are indeed acting as neuron analogs though it is unclear as to how many neurons each instance is equivalent to. Dr. Harlow, I am placing a sample of neural tissue acquired from D13732 into D016002 now. The instances from D13732 have been tagged with a radioactive luminescent dye to distinguish them for extraction later. Dr. Sun, name something to sit in. D016002, couch. Dr. Sun, what is the color of grass? D016002, blue. Dr. Sun, what is one plus one? D016002, two. Dr. Sun, what is 10 times 11? D016002, 111. Dr. Sun, D016002's responses have returned to normal speed. This suggests that it is possible for 150 nervous tissue to be swapped freely between host individuals without rejection. We will now begin the final procedure. D016002, you will be given a full general anesthetic. D016002 is subjected to a general anesthetic, which takes several seconds to begin. Dr. Sun, the patient is now under full anesthesia. Dr. Harlow, you may begin the process of tissue extraction. For this final procedure, we will be attempting to completely replace the brain tissue of D016002 with that of D13732. Previously, during the exploration of D13732's cranial cavity, Dr. Harlow and I observed that the instances connecting his brain matter to his spinal matter were not secured in any way, and in fact seemed to be switching positions with other instances in the brain. We will be seeing how far this compatibility extends. There is silence for the next hour, as doctors Harlow, Sun, and Robin remove the top of D016002's skull and begin extracting her brain matter into a large glass container. Dr. Sun, extraction complete. D016002's brain matter has been successfully removed. Dr. Harlow is now placing D13732's brain matter into D016002's exposed cranial cavity. Silence for several minutes. Dr. Robin, heart rate steady. We have a pulse and breathing. Give it another minute. All right, I'm going to wake her up. 
There is a pause as Dr. Robin reduces the anesthesia, and D016002 awakens. Dr. Sun, what is your name? D016002. Michael. Dr. Harlow, faintly heard in background. Jesus. Dr. Sun, name something to sit in. D016002. Beanbags. Dr. Sun, what is the color of grass? D016002. Green. Dr. Sun, what is one plus one? Quiet sloshing can be detected by the microphone. Dr. Robin, hey, uh, son? D016002. Two. Dr. Robin, son, look. D016002's brain is shown to move of its own accord, subtly moving back and forth. Dr. Harlow, well, that's new. Dr. Sun, do you feel any pain anywhere in your body? D016002. My chest is kind of heavy. Feels just the same otherwise. Dr. Sun, good to hear. Now, what is... D016002. Hey, I usually feel pretty energetic, even before surgeries, but I'm kind of tired right now. Lately, I've been exercising before I sleep, but since I can't sleep here, is it okay if I can just rest a little bit? Dr. Sun, rest. D016002. Like three, five minutes. I can do that here if it's okay. A small portion of the top of D016002's brain parts before making a gurgling sound. After the portion closes, sections of D016002's brain retracts into itself rapidly. D016002's eyes close. Dr. Sun, that doesn't seem good. Dr. Robin steps away from the operation making retching sounds as she leaves the room. Dr. Harlow, D016, uh, D13732, are you okay? D016002, yeah, yawns. I'm fine, why do you ask? Item number, SCP-255, object class, Ketter. Special containment procedures. Tissue samples and specimens related to SCP-255 are contained at Biosite-16, a purpose-built containment and research facility designed to priority beta contagious phenomenon specifications. Biosite-16 is subject to a remote location personnel rotation waiver, in addition to standard contagious phenomenon preventative quarantine periods. Biosite-16 is located in the Vaitupu Atoll of Tuvalu on an island owned by Ragnarok Ecological Modeling Incorporated, a Foundation front organization. Persons and animals determined to be infected with SCP-255 are to be secured and transported to a designated temporary holding facility prior to transfer to Biosite-16. In cases where capture of an SCP-255 carrier is exceedingly difficult or impossible, lethal force is authorized. The Office of Celestial Anomalies is to continually track the orbit of 3214 Hybris, maintain a schedule of upcoming near-Earth flybys, and alert the research director if any changes in observed orbit occur. The next scheduled flyby of 3214 Hybris is the 11th of November 2023, when it is predicted to pass within 950,000 kilometers of Earth. Description. SCP-255 is an anomalous infectious phenomenon of extraterrestrial origin, manifesting in most living subjects as a neurological disorder with varying symptoms. Eligible carriers of SCP-255 have thus far been observed to be organisms possessing a cerebral cortex with approximately greater than or equal to 5.4 billion neurons. Experimentation has determined that species capable of contracting SCP-255 include Humans, chimpanzees, African elephants, bottlenose dolphins, false killer whales, and others. In non-human carriers, SCP-255 causes, through unknown means, degeneration of motor neurons and nerve cells. The rate of degeneration and severity of related symptoms is inversely related to the number of neurons the subject possesses in its cerebral cortex, 
with less neurologically developed organisms displaying the most debilitating effects. The effects of SCP-255 on humans, however, is markably more complex. While degradation of brain cells in the nervous system has been noted on a limited basis in humans, a range of more unusual symptoms occur in these subjects. Individuals infected by SCP-255 can be reliably diagnosed through EEG observation and confirmation of verified markers and measurements of neurological activity. Outbreaks of SCP-255 coincide with close flybys of 3214 hybris, a relationship that was theorized using advanced statistical models following the second outbreak in 1965 and confirmed during the asteroid's 1987 close approach. Observations of 3214 Hybris have determined it to be an approximately 110 meter C-type asteroid, with no anomalous properties observed at this time. The nature of the orbit of 3214 Hybris brings it into close approach with Earth once every 11 years. Addendum 2551 Research Log The following is a listing of known SCP-255 outbreaks and relevant data. Estimated date of outbreak, 23rd of May, 1968. Location, Sagaing, Myanmar. Number of confirmed human cases, 86. Incidence rate, not available. The first known outbreak of SCP-255 occurred in 1968, known now to have coincided with 3214 Hybris passing within 350,000 kilometers of Earth. All known infected individuals resided within 7 kilometers of the township of Malik. Foundation Assets became aware of SCP-255 while investigating an unknown illness affecting certain primates, including humans, in rural regions of northwestern Myanmar. The number of animals affected is unknown, but was estimated at the time to be between 1,000 and 5,000 individuals, primarily among forest-dwelling monkey species. All human instances in a representative sample of infected monkeys were brought under Foundation control, and special containment procedures enacted. In controlled laboratory conditions, animal subjects displayed advanced signs of motor neuron impairment, with a 100% mortality rate over a period of three weeks. Human subjects displayed mild neurological impairment, comparable to that experienced after a minor stroke. Experimentation confirmed that the disorder was not contagious. All human subjects were covered within 10 days and were released without incident after being informed that they were treated under a World Health Organization initiative. Estimated date of outbreak, 19th June, 1979. Locations, Akri, Brazil, Rote Island, Indonesia, Croker Island, Australia. Number of confirmed human cases, 11. Incidence rate, not available. A second SCP-255 outbreak occurred in 1979 in three separate regions, undetected until 19 months later when a routine review of forthcoming medical literature documented several individuals complaining of a phantom limb sensation affecting the dominant hand simulating the spastic movement and persistent ache of an extraneous 11th digit. Foundation personnel covertly interviewed subjects claiming to be affected by this phenomenon. Subsequent research determined that all individuals resided within 25 kilometers of the 11th parallel south and were experiencing an anomalous condition. Lack of person-to-person -person transmission capabilities were confirmed, and disinformation measures in the scientific community were carried out achieving effective containment. The second outbreak was classified as a separate SCP designation until 1984, when research determined it to be the same phenomenon as SCP-255. Estimated date of outbreak, 30th of May, 1990. Locations, Chihuahua, Mexico. Number of confirmed human cases, 121. Incidence rate, not available. The third documented outbreak of SCP-255 occurred in Chihuahua, Mexico in 1990, coinciding with the passage of 3214 Hybris within 550,000 kilometers of Earth. Characteristic of SCP-255, the outbreak is noted to have started in what was at the time the 11th most populous city, 
in the 11th most populous country on Earth. Beginning in this instance and continuing through subsequent outbreaks, only human subjects have been infected by SCP-255. Affected subjects in this outbreak displayed altered circadian rhythms, sleeping for periods between 3-4 to four hours at a time and awaking fully refreshed, conducting activities, and then tiring and sleeping within an average period of 7 hours, thus operating biologically in accordance with an 11-hour day. During interactions with researchers, test subjects displayed a tendency to change subjects in the middle of speaking to say hello in either English, Portuguese, or Indonesian, the languages spoken by infected subjects in the second outbreak. Subjects would state hello in one of these languages regardless of any prior linguistic knowledge and uniformly claimed no recollection of doing so. Additionally, these subjects would address Foundation personnel as members of the World Health Organization without prompting. In all other manners, test subjects observed in this iteration of SCP-255 functioned in their altered biorhythm in a normal manner before recovering and returning to a normal, non-anomalous state within two to three weeks. Estimated date of outbreak, 11th of November, 2001. Locations, Quito, Ecuador. Number of confirmed human cases, 1,331. Incidence rate, 13.9%. The fourth outbreak of SCP-255 took place in an office building in the 12-day Octubre Avenue Business District of Quito, Ecuador. At the time of the outbreak, Ecuador had a population of approximately 11 million people. Additionally, the building in which the initial outbreak was localized was 11 stories high. The fourth outbreak is the first observed instance of SCP-255 being transmitted from person to person, with an incidence rate in laboratory conditions of 13.9%. Infectious iterations of SCP-255 have since been observed to be transmitted from person to person by sustained close proximity, generally within a 2 meter radius, despite the lack of observable pathogens. This change in pathogenicity, along with the higher initial number of cases, was responsible for the reclassification of SCP-255 to Keter, effective the 23rd of December, 2001. Foundation operatives seized control of the building under the established World Health Organization cover. The size of the outbreak, however, mandated heightened secrecy protocols. Test subjects were transported to Biosite 16 for observation. Similar to the second outbreak, infected individuals reported experiencing a phantom limb-like sensation. However, in this event, the phenomenon was intensified greatly. Test subjects reported the sensation of seven additional limbs, originating at seemingly random points of the body, with no apparent relation to existing anatomy. While the precise nature of the additional appendages was difficult to ascertain, infected persons reported that they felt as though they had three joints, were approximately a meter in length, and had no structure analogous to a hand or foot at the end. These limbs were apparently not subject to the painful contractions and sensations normally associated with amputees. However, subjects uniformly reported heightened distress at the sensation of seven additional limbs, moving independently of their control at most times. Additionally, test subjects lost conscious control of their left arms. At most times, subjects were unable to move their left arms. However, at 1100 hours local time each day, the left arms and hands of infected individuals would independently make motions, analogous to what appeared to be the act of writing. When supplied with pen and paper, these individuals all wrote, in crudely formed script, the numbers 11, 11, 65, theorized at the time to be the date of the next outbreak, and confirmed 11 years later. All infected individuals ceased to be affected by SCP-255 within three to four weeks. Test subjects were administered broad-spectrum amnestics and released to Ecuadorian authorities. Foundation assets within the World Health Organization disseminated disinformation related to an exotic strain of malaria and subsequent treatment efforts as part of containment efforts. Estimated date of outbreak, 11th of November, 2012. Locations, Brussels, Belgium. Number of confirmed human cases, 11. Incidence rate, 
100%. The fifth and most recent outbreak of SCP-255 took place in Brussels, Belgium, where 11 individuals working on the 11th floor of the NATO headquarters building all complained to medical staff of constantly hearing a set of 11 electronic tones repeating constantly. Containment protocols were activated by Western Europe sector personnel, and all infected subjects were transported to Biosite 16. Test subjects continued to complain of hearing the repetitive set of tones. Most subjects experienced heightened stress and irritability, as well as sleep deprivation. Infected individuals were administered sedatives to ameliorate secondary SCP-255 symptoms. Testing of this group of infected individuals revealed the incidence rate of SCP-255 was now 100%, ensuring that any humans exposed to the subjects would contract it. Eleven days after the test subjects were secured at Biosite 16, infected individuals reported a cessation of the perceived repetitive tones. One test subject immediately reported hearing an electronic voice, similar to that generated by speech simulation software repeating the Spanish word, Estrella. Once the subject reported the phenomenon to researchers, it immediately ceased, whereupon another of the original 11 test subjects reported a similar phenomenon. The original cluster of infected individuals appear to comprise a phrase in this manner, the constituent words of which were repeated in order for every new case of infection beyond this group. The phrase is transcribed below, translated from Spanish to English for this version of the document. Binary star lost not lost, transpose dead instruction urgent, await transmission. Upon relating to researchers this particular symptom, all test subjects ceased to display any signs of SCP-255 infection. Subjects were amnestitized per SCP-255 guidelines and released. Item Number SCP-311 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures Contained in High Security Item Storage Unit G-78 at Sector 28 Sealed to all personnel without written authorization from three level four or higher senior staff Item barred for use in further research Pending 05 Comprehensive Review Description SCP-311 is a pair of plain black gloves They exhibit extreme flexibility which allows them to fit every hand size tested. Object was recovered from a professed voodoo practitioner, implicated in several suspicious murders and following the incident, the body and all the subject's belongings, including the gloves, were appropriated by the Foundation for containment and study. When worn, the gloves seem innocuous and present no danger to the wearer, Subject responds normally to trauma inflicted on any part of the body, except the hands where the gloves are worn. All trauma and sensation of any tested kind inflicted on the subject's hands is displaced to another individual, theorized to be an individual the subject is focusing on at the time. Both gloves need to be worn for this effect to occur, but the subject need not be aware of the item's properties. Test Log 311-1 Test 1C Test Subjects D238746 D892201 Stimulus Wartenberg Pinwheel Dr. Silas Alright, how do those gloves feel? D238746 Okay, comfortable, I guess. Dr. Silas Good. Now, focus on your partner. Dr. Silas rolls the pinwheel across D238746's gloved hand. D892201 What the fuck? I felt that! Dr. Silas Interesting. End log. Test 2A Test Subjects D238746 D892201 Stimulus Hypodermic Needle Dr. Silas Okay, now focus on your partner. Inserts hypodermic needle. Ow! Oh, I said focus on your partner! D892201. Why, doctor? Did you feel a little poke? Dr. Silas. That's irrelevant. If you don't... Sounds of a scuffle. Guards! Restrain the subject! 
Agent Tyler enters the room. Dr. Silas. Quick, he has the needle in his... F**k, you son of a bitch. Shoot him! Gunshots. And log. Instructions for the following test were issued through a speaker using voice modulation, and D-Class personnel employed were not exposed to any Foundation personnel prior to the test. Test 4D. Test subjects. Data expunged. Stimulus. Concentrated sulfuric acid basin. Dr. Silas. See those people on the other side of the glass? Focus on them while your hands are placed in the basin. Subject's hands lowered by robotic manipulator. After a brief pause, subject D845224 in adjacent room begins to scream, and his hands show signs of acid burns. D- My god, what's happening to him? Why don't the others help? Original subject's screams subside. Subject D986720 begins screaming. D- Is that happening to every person I think about? Oh my god. You have to stop this now. Please, stop! Oh my god. Oh my god. Subject continues pleading until end of log. End log. Note. Subject's wife and daughter were admitted to hospital later that day, presenting with severe acid burns on their hands and heavy blood loss. Was pronounced dead later that night. Directive 311-2. Due to the proven capabilities of SCP-311 and the serious possibility of misuse, it has been decided to isolate it in a Level 4 classified location, pending review. It is also true that the artifacts might prove useful in extreme situations where handling dangerous SCPs proves necessary. In such an event, the use of SCP-311 as supplementary containment equipment will be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. Dr. Item Number SCP-378 Object Class Faumiel Notice from the Foundation Records and Information Security Administration Following the implementation of the Kraken Protocol on 2706-1963, containment procedures for SCP-378 have been updated. Personnel assigned to the SCP-378 project are to review its updated documentation as soon as possible. Claudia Southey, Director Risa. Special Containment Procedures SCP-378 is to be contained in a subterranean entity containment terrarium. Temperature and humidity are to be maintained at levels optimal for the growth and habitation of Heterodermia cane crow, Utica cave lichen, and Prenolepis everettman, North American cave ant. Twice per year, SCP-378 is to undergo a medical and psychological examination. Access to SCP-378's containment terrarium is separated from the surrounding facility by a decontamination chamber. Handling personnel are required to wear full body protection and must be screened for SCP-378-A prior to exiting decontamination. Infected personnel are to be terminated unless the position of SCP-378-1 or 3 is vacant, in which case they are to be assigned to the relevant position instead. As of the adoption of the Kraken Protocol, SCP-378's containment is focused on maintaining its three primary containment components. SCP-378-1 is housed in the Area 19 barracks. SCP-378-1 is employed as a maintenance technician with a security clearance of O-A-19. Upon the death of the current SCP-378-1, brain-dead or comatose reserve personnel may be elected to replace it. As SCP-378-1 is the primary means of communication with SCP-378, care must be maintained to keep SCP-378-1's vocal functions in working order. SCP-378-2 currently takes the form of David Lockheed, a 36-year-old Caucasian male and the employee of the American Supernatural Containment Initiative, ASCII, as a clerical aide, to maintain the continued operations of the SCP Foundation in the United States. SCP-3782 has been tasked with sabotaging ASCII operations against the Foundation, as well as collecting information in the Foundation's interests. SCP-3782 is expected to follow a strict health and exercise regimen due to the inherent difficulty in replacing it. SCP-3783 currently takes the form of Lisa Martin, 
a 33-year-old Mexican-American female employee at the Spicy Crust Pizza in Staten Island. In the event of SCP-3783's death, it must be replaced as soon as possible. Each component is fitted with a tracking device and an audio recorder. Each week, embedded agents stationed near each component are to evaluate the health and integrity of each component and its associated surveillance equipment. The utilization of SCP-378-A in further infiltration is pending Foundation Overwatch approval. Description SCP-378 is an arthropod, superficially resembling a deformed larval instance of Scolopendra gigantea, the Amazonian giant centipede. SCP-378's legs are largely vestigial, primarily meant to assist in peristaltic locomotion. SCP-378 measures 3 meters from mouth to anus, with a bodily thickness of 1 meter and a weight of 233 kilograms. Under normal conditions, SCP-378 is an omnivore, with a diet consisting primarily of lichen and insects. SCP-378 is capable of asexual reproduction at will, producing instances of SCP-378-A from its anus. Instances of SCP-378-A resemble adult Scolopendra gigantea. Dissection suggests this resemblance is superficial, as SCP-378-A lack expected organ systems beyond a primitive neural network. Instances of SCP-378-A are controlled remotely by SCP-378. SCP-378-A are obligate endoparasites, infecting advanced primates such as humans, Homo ignotus, Data Expunged, and Gigantopithecus sapiens, Common Sasquatch. Upon infection, SCP-378-A integrates itself with its host's nervous system through poorly understood means, inducing brain death and extending SCP-378's remote control to the host itself. Vital functions and sensory input remain unaffected. Upon infecting a suitable host, SCP-378 will attempt to reintegrate its hosts into their respective species' social sphere. Once integrated, SCP-378 directs its hosts to indefinitely engage in the behaviors typical for its species, such as communal labor and social recreation. Human hosts prefer environments with a high population density and a robust entertainment scene. The upper limit of active hosts SCP-378 can maintain at any one time is unknown. Upon initial interrogation, SCP-378 confessed to the existence of 26 human hosts, as well as two instances of Alouada Pigra, Guatemalan Black Howler, and three instances of SCP-1000, of which it noted had been acquired during a period of heavy intoxication. Addendum 178-294-B A Psychological Evaluation of SCP-378 Conducted by Dr. Simon Glass Tentatively designated Scolopendra Animalia, SCP-378 is unique among arthropods, possessing either human levels of sapience or the ability to emulate its host's intellectual faculties. In any case, SCP-378 is self-aware and remarkably intelligent. SCP-378's relationship to its hosts is complicated. While SCP-378 maintains a consistent sense of identity across multiple hosts, each is treated as a persona for SCP-378 to roleplay. Hosts rarely interact with SCP-378 or fellow hosts, suggesting SCP-378 primarily utilizes its anomalous abilities for entertainment. This is further suggested by SCP-378's readiness to abandon such personas under duress. Aside from integration into human social spheres, host behavior is largely unique to each instance. Extroversion is relatively common. Hosts rarely isolate themselves except to sleep or excrete. SCP-378 appears to take equal enthusiasm in stressful versus pleasant situations. Of note, SCP-378 is particularly attached to the identity of Lisa Martin. In contrast to other hosts, Lisa Martin's weekly routine is relatively static. From 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. on all days except Saturday, Miss Martin will show up to work at the nearest pizzeria from the former location of Digian Antonio's Pies, regardless of employment status or scheduled hours. From 6 p.m. to 11 p.m. on all days except Saturday, 
Miss Martin will engage in the maintenance of one of 17 rooftop gardens across the city of New York. Of these, 13 are maintained by a cooperative, 12 of which Miss Martin is not a part of. From 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. on Saturdays, Miss Martin alternates between socializing with a collection of friends, co-workers, and lovers, and playing piano for various high-end bars. From 11 p.m. to 12 a.m., Miss Martin will shower and prepare for bed. Miss Martin will sleep from 12 a.m. to 7 a.m., when she will wake up and prepare for the next cycle. In the event of Miss Martin's death, SCP-378 will direct another host to assume her identity. Attempts to interrupt Miss Martin's routine have been unilaterally met with unusual levels of hostility from SCP-378 and its hosts. From Assistant Director Daniela Hayden, Classification Level Rise of 4, Employee Number 134, to Director Kelsey Feinstein, Classification Level XK4, Employee Number 87, Regarding, 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 Identifying current hosts. Date 2704 1963. Director Feinstein. Mr. Song and Dr. Glass's work have revealed quite a bit about SCP 378. Most importantly, I do not believe it understands the significance of social dynamics, especially in regards to hierarchy and social capital. Several of SCP 378's identities held surprising positions of power. Indeed, Two of them, David Lockheed and Alfonso Liaz, are beyond reach of the Foundation's current capacity to contain. Despite this, SCP-378 has shown a willingness to sacrifice such hosts in order to defend, replace, or otherwise maintain Lisa Martin. Odd, yes, but useful enough. It'd be a shame if something were to happen to Miss Martin and her friends, would it not? SCP-378 is sapient but it by no means understands the significance of its actions. With a little bit of persuasion, David Lockheed might yet ascend from petty paper pusher for the ASCII, right where the Foundation most needs a puppet. And, if I'm not mistaken, spicy crust pizza can always do with a second franchise. Proposal Employing SCP-378's anomalous abilities to defend Foundation operations in the United States. Council Vote Summary Approved Proposal Accepted The Kraken Protocol has been initiated From Senior Researcher Sang Hun Song Classification Level Gamma U3 Employee Number 148 2 Director Kelsey Feinstein Classification Level XK4 Employee Number 87 Regarding Delays in the Gamma U-2677 project. Date, 2107-1965. So, good news and bad news, Director. Good news, as I'm assuming you already heard. With the plans for construction of Site-56, all thanks to a certain Mr. Lockheed, the Kraken Protocol's getting a much-needed expansion. With its relative proximity to both the Lily of the Valley Nexus and the Pacific Northwest, it's a perfect opportunity to expand the scope of SCP-1000's containment, while ensuring the ASCII doesn't suck LOTV dry before we get to it. For all its oddities, SCP-378 appears to be delighted at the prospect of a change in scenery. I can't imagine a tropical centipede grub likes having a sphere of influence limited to New England of all places, but that's besides the point. Its A was compliant enough on the way there. Which leads me to the bad news. Rupert Tremont's a fun little guy, agent of the FBI's unofficial Unusual Incidents Unit, and all too stupid to trust Agent Ryans with his drink while he went to the restroom. After that, it's a matter of transport back to Provisional Area 56 in Black Rock, and a centipede down the gullet. Problem comes up when 378 tells us it can't establish a connection. Now, Tremont's still alive, so that's not normal. We run a number of tests, try to figure out what went wrong. And that's when we see a different centipede in his head, where our centipede usually goes. More to come, but I have a bad feeling about this. Item number SCP-413 Object Class Safe 
Special Containment Procedures All entrances to SCP-413 are to be sealed and put under armed guard. Under no circumstances are unauthorized persons allowed to enter SCP-413, with guards authorized to use lethal force. Any personnel entering SCP-413 for experiments are required to wear GPS trackers and safety lines at all times. Should containment be breached, or by O5 decree, Containment Protocol 413 must be immediately enacted by the highest ranking personnel present. Description SCP-413 is a four-story parking garage located in Inside, SCP-413 has a variable environment that dynamically alters itself. In effect, SCP-413 is able to change its internal structure, such as moving ramps, adding floors, changing staircases, and so on. However, when observed from the outside, there is no indication of any of these changes taking place. While accurate measurement of SCP-413's interior has proven impossible, it is well established that the interior is larger than the building's external dimensions, and that the interior dimensions are constantly changing. Another effect SCP-413 appears to have is to interfere with an individual's sense of direction. Analysis of recordings taken of the interior reveal that SCP-413 generates a low-frequency sound within its interior that shuts down or interferes with several key regions of the human brain, controlling navigation, balance, and short-term memory. Extended exposure to this sound is known to cause several side effects, such as nausea, dizziness, vomiting, vertigo, anxiety, claustrophobia, and in some rare cases, data expunged. However, these effects will eventually wear off once the affected individual leaves SCP-413. Under no circumstances are personnel to enter SCP-413 without navigation aids and safety lines. Navigation within SCP-413 without the use of such equipment is nearly impossible, as the combination of the constantly shifting interior, as well as the disrupting sound frequency, interfere too much with natural human navigation. SCP-413 was discovered when a security guard that worked at the site turned in security tapes of SCP-413 to the local police department, suspecting that they had been tampered with. The tapes were immediately confiscated, and the entire site was bought out by the Foundation. Addendum 1 After several incursions, it has been discovered that SCP-413 is in fact sapient. Though not evident at first, SCP-413 is capable of independent thought and possesses human-level intelligence. Communication was initiated via the painted words and signs on SCP-413's walls which it is able to manipulate to form individual words and sentences. Analysis of SCP-413's behavior suggests that it is highly mischievous and enjoys playing pranks on the unsuspecting. However, it does take great offense to being wronged, and is shown to possess a vengeful and possibly even sadistic side. Interview Log Doctor Hello SCP-413 SCP-413 Hello, Doctor. Doctor. All right, let's get this interview started, shall we? How long have you been aware of your own existence? SCP-413. Since the day I was built. Doctor. And when was that? SCP-413. I don't remember, it's something I don't think about. Doctor. Why are you constantly changing your interior? SCP-413. Because it's boring sitting here all day. Doctor. So, you don't do it for any particular reason. SCP-413. I do it for fun, but the others don't approve. Doctor. Others. SCP-413. The buildings next door and across the street don't believe I'm a productive member of society and that I will give away their plans. Doctor. What plans? SCP-413 That we attack tomorrow. Doctor Visibly pales. SCP-413 
Ha ha ha, just kidding. Did you see the look on your face? It's hilarious. Doctor, I think we're done for today. SCP-413, you're no fun. Video Logs The following video logs were recorded by security cameras before SCP-413 was discovered and contained. Video Log 1 Subject Family of Six Tourists Description SCP-413 proceeds to thwart any attempts for the subjects to find their vehicle. It continually changes signs and markers to mislead and confuse the subjects for the next 20 minutes. Video Log 2 Subject Neglectful Mother and Her Child Description Subject is continually led around in circles, with every path she takes eventually leading her back to her car, where she was keeping her child locked in. The cycle continues for seven minutes before the subject finally gives up and leaves SCP-413 with her child. Video Log 3 Subject Businessman Description By manipulating rampant sign placement, SCP-413 leads the subject around in circles and forces him to drive through a complex and confusing path before letting him exit. Video Log 4 Subject Group of Five Teenage Vandals Description Subjects enter SCP-413 and begin vandalizing vehicles in the interior of SCP-413. Data expunged. Addendum 2 The five teenage youths seen in Video Log 4 were found on date expunged by a Foundation exploration team. The teens were still alive, though exhausted, malnourished, and dehydrated, despite being declared missing for over three months. Before being administered Class A amnestics and returned to their families, the five teenagers revealed that they were locked in an inescapable labyrinth, created by SCP-413, and were kept alive only by several water fountains and vending machines that would conveniently appear. They also stated that data expunged. The five teenagers were apparently inside SCP-413 for the entire exploration phase, somehow eluding our deep-sensing equipment. Further exploration suspended, pending further review. Containment Protocol 413 Due to Dr. R's insistence and the inability to plant demolition charges within SCP-413, contingency, in the case of a major containment breach, will instead be carried out via controlled demolition of the entire city block. Item Number SCP-456 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures The SCP-456 colony is to be kept in a sealed containment room. Personnel entering the containment area should wear Level 1 biohazard suits to avoid being bitten by SCP-456, and the suits must be treated with insecticide upon leaving the enclosure. When not being used in experiments, SCP-456 must be fed 70 milliliters of human or animal blood per 100 insects, weekly. Description SCP-456 is a variety of the common bed bug. In addition to an anticoagulant, SCP-456 injects data expunged when biting its host, causing the brain to produce adenosine, endorphins, and a narcotic identified as an analog of fentanyl. As a result, Victims of SCP-456 infestations experience increasing euphoria and somnolence as the number of insects increases, eventually sleeping 24 hours a day. SCP-456 was identified after a number of individuals were found dead in their homes, suffering from varying degrees of malnutrition, blood loss, and narcotics toxicity. SCP-456 continues to be a problem in the wild. To reduce the number of infestations, the CDC has issued a false report that bedbugs carry malaria and must be exterminated when found. Addendum 4D class were requisitioned for exposure to SCP-456 to determine long-term effects. Experiment 456-1 D-17514 exposed to SCP-456 and fed standard rations 
but given no other special treatment. After 17 days of exposure, D-17514 slept constantly and was unable to care for himself. Subject expired from malnutrition days later. Experiment 456-2 D-17515 exposed to SCP-456 and fed intravenously when unable to care for herself. Subject expired from blood loss after days. Experiment 456-3 D-17516 exposed to SCP-456, fed intravenously, and given periodic blood transfusions as needed. Subject expired from narcotic overdose after days. Experiment 456-4 D-17517 exposed to SCP-456, fed intravenously, and given periodic blood transfusions in addition to small doses of a narcotic antagonist. Subject survived for days and was supporting a colony of insects at conclusion of experiment. D-17517 remanded for amnestic treatment and reassignment on date expunged. Addendum Mobile Task Force IOTA-10, Dam Feds, is investigating a report that a drug cartel located in Mexico is kidnapping members of the public, breeding SCP-456 and extracting the narcotics produced by the victims under the cover of DEA operatives. Anyone found to be using SCP-456 in this manner is to be terminated. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.